He was determined to gain power at any cost. Once, he was the most powerful leader in Europe, aspiring to become the modern Julius Caesar of Rome, even imitating Caesar's mannerisms in his gestures. Figures like Hitler, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Alama Iqbal were all mesmerized by him. His followers would eliminate his opponents at his mere signal and then hang them upside down in the square. However, as time turned, he too was hung upside down in the same square. In our series, Who Was He? We will show you the story of a fascist. Mussolini, as a schoolboy, was known for stabbing other children with a knife. He was the school bully and was expelled from every other school he attended. As he grew up, this once detested boy developed a charisma, attributed to his handsome appearance and confident speech. His tall stature and strong physique had a captivating effect on people, making him the life of the party wherever he went. However, he was deeply influenced by Karl Marx's personality. This was evident when Mussolini, in search of work, traveled from Italy to Switzerland with not a penny in his pocket, but always carried a picture of Karl Marx. In Switzerland, he initially did odd jobs before landing a job in a trade union. His role was to propagate in favor of the union. Mussolini was fond of reading and had a knack for smooth talking, making his propaganda popular. However, the Swiss government did not appreciate his propaganda, and when they began action against socialists, Mussolini was arrested. As often happens, his fame only increased after his arrest, with news about him spreading rapidly in his homeland, Italy. After being released from jail, Mussolini returned to Italy and became a schoolmaster. However, just as he had not been a good student, he was not a good teacher either, and left the job to work again for trade unions. But by then, Italy was facing the same issue as Switzerland had. The government was not pleased with the trade unions, and so Mussolini found himself behind bars in his own country as well. In 1909, when he gained some freedom for a short period, he fell in love with the 16-year-old daughter of his father's former lover. Mussolini's love was successful, and the two became life partners. He was a well-known writer for communist newspapers, but in 1912, he started his own newspaper, La Lota di Classe, The Class Struggle. This newspaper became so popular that socialists made him the editor of another newspaper, Avanti, Forward or Progressive. Mussolini was such an effective editor that he doubled the circulation of Avanti in a short time. Now, he was not. Just an editor, but also an active member of the Socialist Party, Mussolini was on the path to becoming a great revolutionary. However, during this period, World War I broke out, and Mussolini saw a new opportunity to achieve his ambitions. Initially, as the Socialists were against the war, Mussolini strongly opposed it. But when he saw the country's wealthy class investing in the war, he changed his stance and started supporting the war. His socialist colleagues objected, saying they were against the war. Mussolini responded by quoting Karl Marx, Revolution comes after the war. However, the socialist faction did not accept this argument. Mussolini was stripped of his editorship and expelled from the party, leading him to develop a deep hatred for the socialists. But perhaps he no longer needed them, as he had found capitalist allies who were making money by selling arms and other goods during the war. Mussolini then did two things. First, he used his oratory skills to incite war fervor among the people. Second, he joined the battlefield himself, armed and ready. When the war ended, Italy and its allies were victorious. Returning from the battlefield, Mussolini was welcomed like a conqueror, and his stature grew even further. But after the war, Italy had grievances against its allies, France and Britain. Italy received only a small portion of the conquered territories, namely minor parts of Austria and Jordan, while most of the territories taken from the Ottoman Empire, such as Syria and Iraq, were divided between France and Britain. Additionally, Italy was facing a severe financial crisis caused by the war. Mussolini took advantage of this financial crisis as well. Instead of informing the people that the country was in crisis due to the war and conflicts, Mussolini began politicizing the economy. He played a dangerous game, inciting rebellion against the system for personal fame. He argued that Italy now needed a dictator to elevate its stature in the world, claiming that the current system had brought shame to Italy among nations. 
The reality, however, was that Italy's dire situation was partly due to the war in which Mussolini himself had actively participated. Yet, whether it was his eloquent rhetoric or charismatic personality, a significant and passionate portion of the populace had become his fervent supporters. He spoke of Italian nationalism superiority, and his words resonated deeply with his followers. A year after the war, in 1919, over 200 former soldiers and political activists gathered in Milan, Italy. Inspired by Mussolini's philosophy, they formed a political party and named Mussolini as their leader. This party was called the Fascist Party, a name derived from the Latin word fascist, meaning a bundle of rods, which symbolized strength through unity. The party emblem was a bundle of rods and an axe. The Fascist Party consisted of two sections, the political fascists and the military fascists. The latter, known for wearing black shirts, became famous across Europe as the Black Shirts. While Mussolini had successfully formed his party, it still lacked one element crucial for a nationalist movement, an enemy to blame for the nation's problems, to incite hatred against, and to use when necessary. Luckily for Mussolini, he didn't have to look far. His former love, Karl Marx, and the concept of socialism now stood as his adversaries. During that time, socialists in Italy were frequently protesting and striking for their rights, leading to work stoppages in factories. Mussolini declared these socialist elements responsible for Italy's problems, claiming their protests and strikes had halted the nation's progress. The fascists soon openly waged war against the socialist groups. Trade union offices were torched, and hundreds of socialists were killed. Throughout this chaos, the government remained a silent spectator, partly because it too was exasperated with the strikes of the labor class. Perhaps the government was even content that an organization was voluntarily doing its job, so there was no need for them to intervene. However, they were unaware that this fight against socialism was just a precursor to what was yet to come. In reality, Mussolini was preparing to seize control of the entire Italy. His speeches were evidence of his desire to become like Julius Caesar, the great emperor of Rome before Christ. In a move of naivety or simplicity, the government had unwittingly facilitated its own downfall by giving Mussolini an opportunity. Mussolini's armed organization, the Black Shirts, began to take over cities. By 1920, most parts of Italy were practically under fascist control, with the government's authority nowhere in sight. Two years later, Mussolini gave the government an ultimatum. Either resign and hand over power to him, or his supporters would march towards Rome and forcefully seize power. This declaration was essentially an announcement of an assault and takeover of Italy's central city. On October 28, 1922, thousands of armed fascist party members, the Black Shirts, gathered outside Rome, awaiting a call from their leader, who was in his headquarters in Milan, waiting for another. The telegram he awaited finally arrived, bringing him great joy. He no longer needed to assault Rome. The army was under the command of King Victor Emmanuel III, not the Prime Minister, and the King had written that if Mussolini abandoned his march towards Rome, he would be appointed as Prime Minister. Dressed in finery, Mussolini arrived in Rome, met the King, and took over as Prime Minister, but he also demanded dictatorial powers for a year. The fascist party had become akin to a full army, and the King appeared powerless. Thus he agreed to all conditions. After becoming dictator, Mussolini formed his first cabinet, primarily composed of people who were not his party's old workers. Many weren't even party members, illustrating the irony of politics where those who weren't part of the journey often reached the destination. In the 1924 parliamentary elections, Mussolini blatantly rigged the elections, using force to ensure victory for most of his candidates. With Mussolini's supporters now in the majority in parliament, changing laws became much easier for him, and he transformed from a temporary to a permanent dictator. His most significant challenge at this point was his past impassioned speeches, in which he had presented himself as the sole solution to all of Italy's problems, making his rule seem essential. Now that he was in power, he knew that failing to fulfill promises would quickly lead to the Italian public's disillusionment with him. Therefore, he focused his efforts on establishing law and order and undertaking developmental projects. To garner public support, he also propagated the notion that he was a devoutly religious person. To demonstrate his religious devotion, he undertook several measures, 
including recognizing Vatican City near Rome as an independent state. To this day, Vatican City remains one of the world's smallest countries. Alongside his show of religious faith, Mussolini continued to punish his opponents, restrict the media, impose bans on trade unions, and arrest socialist workers. When Mussolini became the ruler of Italy, it was a critical time in the world. The communist revolution had already occurred in Soviet Russia, a radical form of socialism. Therefore, European powers and the United States considered anyone who could help suppress socialism as an ally. This was probably why Western powers warmly welcomed Mussolini's rise to power. The Christian spiritual leader, Pope Pius VII, referred to Mussolini as a man sent by providence. Winston Churchill, who later became the British Prime Minister, called Mussolini the greatest living legislator. Moreover, when Roosevelt became the President of the United States, he regarded Mussolini as a representative of peace in the world and a potential great ally for America. Mussolini's personality and revolution were so influential that even Alama Iqbal, when he went to London for the Round Table Conference in 1931, made a point to visit Mussolini in Italy. Impressed by Mussolini after their meeting, Iqbal wrote a poem in his honor. Mussolini's admirers were not limited to Iqbal, Churchill, and Roosevelt. At this time, a young, former German soldier was also among Mussolini's admirers, aspiring to follow in Mussolini's footsteps. This young man was Adolf Hitler. Hitler, inspired by Mussolini's fascism, developed Nazism, an even more dangerous ideology, proclaiming the German nation as the world's superior race. Hitler held great respect for Mussolini. When Hitler came to power in Germany in 1933, he maintained close relations with Mussolini's dictatorship. Mussolini supported Hitler to the extent of depriving many Jews of their jobs or arresting and sending them to Hitler. While Mussolini considered Hitler an ally, he did not personally like him much. When Hitler visited Italy in 1934 and they went for a drive, Hitler asked Mussolini to hand over Austria to Germany. Mussolini's refusal angered Hitler and both left the car in a disgruntled state. Later, when Mussolini was asked about the matter, he described Hitler as nothing more than an ordinary mad clown. However, some time later, Mussolini did cede Austria to Germany, which improved their relations. Mussolini then started to think beyond Italy's borders. In 1935, with Hitler's support, he conquered the African country of Ethiopia. A few years later, he also took control of the small European nation of Albania. Meanwhile, his friend Hitler, driven by extremist ideologies, had sparked World War II and was winning. The successes of Hitler in Poland and France made Mussolini envious. Not wanting Hitler to conquer all of Europe alone, Mussolini decided to join World War II, starting with an invasion of Greece. The Greco-Italian War is one of World War II's most interesting battles. On one side was Italy, a significant power, and on the other, Greece, a weaker nation. Mussolini offered Greek politicians and generals a generous deal to hand over Greece to him, promising them riches. Despite being weaker, Greece was not swayed by greed. When Mussolini, filled with anger and conquest fervor, attacked Greece, the Greek army resoundingly defeated them. The Italian army was forced to retreat, and the Greeks even pursued them into Albania. Britain, an ally of Greece, also started destroying Italian ships. As Mussolini found himself in a difficult position, he reached out to Hitler for help, the same man he once disparagingly called a petty mad clown. Hitler initially reprimanded Mussolini for invading Greece without consulting him, but eventually agreed to assist. In 1941, German forces came to Mussolini's aid, attacked Greece, and managed to conquer it in just three weeks. However, the defeat in Greece was a significant blow to Mussolini's charismatic image, and public confidence in him began to wane. As Mussolini's influence waned at home, opposing forces grew stronger. Within three years, Mussolini's forces suffered humiliating defeats in Somalia, Ethiopia, North Africa, and Russia. The final straw came in 1943, when American and British forces attacked the Italian island of Sicily. Mussolini, once a powerful figure, could do nothing but watch. This led to a meeting of the Fascist Grand Council, where it was decided that to avoid enmity with America and Britain, 
Mussolini had to be removed from power. Mussolini refused to accept this decision, believing he was still the rightful ruler. Ignoring the party and council's decision, he showed up at his office the next day. However, the King of Italy had turned against him, and the black shirts had weakened due to continuous defeats. On the King's orders, Mussolini was arrested and imprisoned in a remote mountainous area. When news of Mussolini's arrest became public, the once feared dictator's statues and portraits were destroyed across the country. Hitler, Mussolini's mad friend, came to his rescue. German commandos freed Mussolini and brought him to Munich, Germany. Hitler's forces then occupied northern Italy and installed Mussolini as the ruler there. However, Mussolini, who once dreamt of establishing a Roman Empire and saw himself as the likes of Julius Caesar, Augustus, and Constantine, had now become a puppet of Hitler. Churchill, once an admirer, commented that Mussolini was now nothing more than Hitler's minion or tenant farmer. As time passed and 1945 arrived, Germany, initially the major player in World War II, was retreating. Hitler's forces were retreating everywhere, and Mussolini, alive only due to Hitler's support, was becoming isolated. When Hitler's defeat seemed imminent, Mussolini decided to flee Italy. The photo you mentioned is said to be the last picture of Mussolini alive. On April 26th, a convoy of German soldiers and civilians heading to Switzerland for asylum included an elderly couple, a 61-year-old soldier wearing a German Air Force helmet and an overcoat, accompanied by a 33-year-old woman, apparently his daughter, but actually his lover. The next day, April 27th, when the convoy was only 25 kilometers from Switzerland near Lake Como in the town of Dongo, it was stopped by a group of armed socialists. With the defeat of the Germans, the socialists had become powerful. Mussolini's supporters, now being hunted and executed by the socialists, were desperately seeking him to settle scores. When the convoy was searched, someone recognized the elderly German soldier. It was Benito Mussolini, disguised and accompanied by his lover, Clara Patacci, who had vowed to stay with him until death. The socialists, upon capturing Mussolini, were ecstatic. They imprisoned both Mussolini and Patacci in a farmhouse. The following day, they were taken from the farmhouse to a nearby village. There, the couple was ordered to stand against a stone wall. Realizing his imminent death, Mussolini reportedly told the socialist with a gun, aim straight at my heart. There are also accounts that Mussolini remained silent in his final moments. This was the man who fired the shot that ended Mussolini's life. Mussolini, Patacci, and other fascist bodies were loaded onto a truck and taken back to Milan, where Mussolini had once been a ruler. Their bodies were dumped in the town square like garbage. This was the same city where Mussolini had formed the fascist party and, with Hitler's help, established his last government. It was the same city and square where, just eight months earlier, Mussolini had dumped the bodies of 1,300 socialist workers. Now, Mussolini and his companions lay there, subjected to public scorn and desecration, including being hung upside down and stoned. Among those brought to join Mussolini in death was Achilles Starash, who had once declared Mussolini a deity. Starash was brought before Mussolini's dead body and told, look at the end of your god. Despite facing death, Starash, firm in his beliefs, saluted his deceased leader before being shot and hung beside him. Mussolini's body was buried in a cemetery outside Milan, but even in death, he became a problem. Opponents would go to his grave to kick and desecrate it. In April 1946, some of Mussolini's supporters exhumed his body. They cleaned it and took it with them, leaving a note at the grave expressing their inability to endure the desecration of their leader's body by communists. They vowed to cover him in flowers, saying that the fragrance of his virtues would overpower even the scent of the flowers. After Mussolini's supporters exhumed his body, the government initiated a search. In August, after several months of efforts, Mussolini's remains were recovered from a sanctuary south of Milan and taken into government custody. Years later, when Adon Zoli became Prime Minister of Italy, he handed over the remains to Mussolini's widow, Donna Racelle, to gain the support of right-wing politicians. In 1957, these remains were buried in the Mussolini family tomb in Romagna, complete with a statue and party symbols. The site where Mussolini was executed is now marked by a black slab. 
Mussolini's son, Romano Mussolini, became a renowned pianist and film producer in Italy. His granddaughter, Alessandra Mussolini, was elected as a member of the European Parliament for Italy. At the Milan railway station, a picture of Mussolini still hangs, although someone has gouged out the eyes in the image. Today, fascism is considered an unacceptable ideology worldwide. However, in Italy, there remains a faction that still regards Mussolini, the founder of the fascist party, as correct. They hold ceremonies at his grave and believe that a return to Mussolini's ideologies would restore Italy's former glory. The legacy of Mussolini remains complex. Some view him as a tyrant, while others see him as a revolutionary whose ambitions failed. This duality in perspectives continues to spark discussions and debates.